Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra, and I'm from Open Lafina Foundation. And I'm very grateful to welcome you at our house, Open Lafina Foundation House, where you can find Nordic Council of Ministers, Open Lafina Foundation, and you create hub. So all main institutions to discuss this topic today. So I wanted to welcome you and uh, wish uh, fruitful discussion, deep listening, and many questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, our dear Nordic partners. Um, and thank you all for your trust. I know that the topic is not that familiar. Uh, and at the same time, I imagine that you're here because of your personal curiosity and willingness to, to grow and um, widen horizons. My name is Katerina Yasko. I'm coming from Kyiv, Ukraine. Um, I'm here since March 2022, um, traveling back and forth Ukraine, Lithuania during this period and looking forward to go back this summer. Um, I'd like to say a few words um, about myself through this story with this book because it is very closely related to our today's topic. So, um, I'm an educator, I'm a psychologist, um, I am a facilitator of um, various kinds of discussions and um, group work. I am also founder of uh, two NGOs. And um, uh, in 2017, I had a very special meeting. A friend of mine with whom we got to know um, each other in Sweden in 2016, whose name is Alexander Bjorkman, um, contacted me and said, listen, my father is flying via Kiev to Greece. Um, and I imagine that it was a, a meeting of a club of Rome or some important event where um, world intellectuals get together to discuss the most challenging uh, topics of the day. So he encouraged me to meet him and we met. And he presented me this book and uh, he emphasized that it might be a silver bullet. It might be the thing that actually Europe, both Eastern and Western and the whole world needs in order to, de to develop uh, democracy and in order to make sure that um, those challenges that we are facing are met in a proper way. Um, I was a little skeptical uh, hearing about any kind of silver bullet. <laughs> and at the same time, very curious. So I started to read. After reading this book, uh, I, I did have a feeling it is a silver bullet. And together with colleagues, one of my colleagues is here today, one of the speakers, Sergei Chumachenko, and other Ukrainian um, intellectuals, we did our best to make sure this book is issued in Ukrainian language. And I had a privilege and honor to be the um, scientific editor, one of the scientific editors of the Ukrainian translation of this book. So in 2021, it, it was published. Why the silver bullet? I'm Ukrainian and uh, we Ukrainians have a strong feeling that we do not have that much time for building democracy as many other countries in the western part of the world had. We need to be um, effective and we need to learn fast. So we need the best practices from all over the world in order to empower our people, our society, and to build democracy, to get a good vaccine against autocracy, because, you know, we still have it in our memory. 
Soviet Union and all what it br brought. So we need to um, inculcate into our society and especially education system some sort of practices that will allow us to grow as soon as possible. When I'm saying to grow, of course, I do not mean biological aspects of growth. I mean intellectual, emotional, moral, spiritual, aesthetic. Um, and this book, The Nordic Secret, A European Story of Beauty and Freedom, is actually about that. I was amazed uh, reading the first chapter, and it's actually very interesting um, to see that there are several countries out of up to 200 countries that are registered by the United Nations, that there are several who always rate first or in the top 10 in the World Happiness Report, in the uh, ca uh, Human Capital Report, um, in terms of transparency of economy, and many other ratings that are official, that are published. And you always see there Denmark, Norway, um, Finland has, has made a huge leap within quite short time uh, in the beginning of the eight, uh, 20th century. And then, uh, of course, Sweden and Iceland. So um, I'd like to connect the dots uh, and then pass the floor to Lena Rachel Anderson, who is our honorable speaker of today. I think that Nordic countries do have a silver bullet. I was surprised when I um, came to Lithuania that, of course, with the huge impact that Nordic countries have in Baltic states, there is not much um, shared about education, about the special approaches and best practices in not only children but adult education that were present in uh, Nordic countries for almost 1.5, like 150 um, years, that were not borrowed in uh, Baltic states. Some of them were in Estonia. But I didn't hear anything like that around Latvia and Lithuania. Um, so I imagine that not only we Ukrainians, but also Lithuanians can uh, re enrich um, uh, ourselves um, by getting to know more about those special approaches to educating the society that Nordic countries have to offer. And my next dream is, and I, of course, it's, it's more of Lithuanian business, let's say, but we, I believe, need to get it uh, translated. And ne we need to get more information about Bildung, and we're going to speak about this concept very soon. Um, uh, it's spoken about and discussed all over Eastern Europe. Um, one of the questions that I want to hi highlight um, in the second part of our discussion, because first, just few words about the order of, of our talks. I, I will pass the floor to Lene, and then I would want my um, colleague, Sergei Chomachenka, to share how we started to apply it in Ukraine. And then I will invite uh, my fellow colleague and friend, Irena Pronskivichute, to, to speak about what is the ground here in Lithuania, um, how it could be applied, and how can we mutually um, enrich each other, especially using the situation of the war and crisis and uh, so many Ukrainian refugees all over Europe. And one of the pieces that I would wish to share is how the concept of Bildung and the Nordic practices became the inspiration for a project that has been implemented here in Lithuania by a Ukrainian team of Svetlana Zoluzhna and uh, a team of uh, Lithuanian colleagues, um, which is called Tula, you probably heard of it, LT plus UA, right? And how uh, from the very beginning, last summer, we used the concept of Bildung and this book 
as a support and inspiration in order to build the program of this mutual cultural exchange um, and how it now sh already shows its results. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your trust uh, and being with us today. We are here till 8.30 and um, we will listen to our speakers first and then I hope that it, there will be a rich discussion with you. Mm -hmm. Lene, the floor is yours. Um, so Lene Rachel Andersen is a um, Danish philosopher, visionary, author tones of books, like 18, something like that, 20, 20 books, um, most of them are in Danish, right. Um, and uh, a person who has been uh, dedicating her life basically to bringing to the world something extremely precious, not that modern as we might think. At the same time, um, Lena is modernizing. Uh, uh, there is this concept of meta-modernity. It's a more of a philosophical co concept, but she is the one who tries to speak about the quite old and established things in a totally new way, totally applicable to our current context and uh, challenges that we are facing. Thank you. Lena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So now I need my slides on the other computer and until I see them on the screen, I will um, tell everybody what Bildung is or the way that I now describe it. I would also like to say to the translator, please just use the word Bildung and don't call it something else. Uh, a typical translation from the German use of the word would be education, but please use the word Bildung because Bildung is something very special. It comes from the German word Bild, and in the 1600s, uh, Bildung uh, was to shape yourself uh, in the build, the image, so build means image, the image of Christ. So you had this ideal uh, and you shaped yourself in that image and you grew by doing so. In the 1700s, this concept became a secular concept and that's what I'm gonna talk about in more detail. So it became the image of that which is uniquely you. You unfold and become fully you and that is Bildung. That is a very fluffy thing to say. It's hard to say, so what does that mean? So the way that I now describe it, so that as educators and uh, decision makers, we can be better at uh, working with it. So I now describe Bildung as two different kinds of knowledge. The first kind of knowledge is the knowledge that is very easy to transfer, or relatively easy to transfer from person to person. Um, and that can be most of what we tend to think of when we think of school and education. So it can be math, it can be science, it can be learning another language, it can be geography, or it can be, uh, so I don't know if somebody moved this forward, but let's just keep the, the sign here the way it is. Um, so, uh, so the easily transferable kind of knowledge is a horizontal transfer from person to person. And um, it can also be practical things like baking a bread or cooking a meal. And it's relatively easy to find out if people have learned what you tried to teach them. Why does that is one kind of knowledge. And we can test if the other person or the classroom, the kids in the class have learned it. Because we can see if they can do the math. We can see if they understand the science. We can hear if they can speak the foreign language. So um, this is what we're pretty good at in schools. But there's a different kind of, uh, <laughs> there's a different kind of knowledge, uh, which is the uh, life experience that you cannot transfer from person to person. So that is uh, falling in love. Uh, your boyfriend, girlfriend breaks up with you. Um, it is uh, getting a job, keeping up, being a good friend. That kind of knowledge you cannot transfer from person to person. You can tell somebody else about your experience and if you just fell in love and it's so wonderful and you try to tell your friend 
And if that friend has never been in love, they won't understand what you're talking about. But if they have been in love, you just have to say, I met this wonderful guy, and it's like, oh wow, you're in love. They will know what you're talking about. There is a resonance in the other person. And this is the life experience. This is the depth of our emotions. It's our moral character that comes with this. We can also have these experiences from uh, culture, from, uh, from fiction, from aesthetics. So we can connect with our cultural heritage and we can connect with other people through, um, through our emotions and through culture. And it's also our upbringing. So it's the values and good behaviors that parents and other adults told us. And we can try to teach that to other people. It's usually not very popular when we do it with other adults. But it's something that you have to grow into and it takes a while. So you cannot transfer this. The one place where we kind of can transfer this from one person to the next is through literature. If you read a book that is well written, you can identify with the characters in the book and you can feel what they feel. You can mirror their emotions. And so you can feel what it's like to be a prisoner of war, uh, a nurse in a different country, what it means to be alone in a foreign country or something like that, even though you do not have that experience. Um, so so you, can, you can learn different things about being a human being through literature. And one of the reasons why literature is better than movies, for instance, is that if you watch a movie, somebody shows you all the pictures. They usually also add music, so they kind of tell you what kind of emotions you're supposed to have. But if you read a book, you're left alone with that little, you know, all those black things on the white paper. You have to turn them into words. You have to turn them into images in your brain, and you turn them into emotions and a different kind of experience. So you can actually have some of that life experience transferred via literature. Um, so uh, there is one way of, of transferring this vertical kind of knowledge. And together, these two kinds of knowledge is Bildung. But it's also very personal because we're all born different. I'll, okay, I'll just keep an eye on it and um, do my best. So I'll, you know, when you say to children, I got eyes in my, the back of my head, so I will, I will use those eyes in the back of my head. Um, <laughs> so uh, part of, of, or developing as an individual and becoming fully who you are is to have your personal relationship to everything that you learned and everything that you experienced and to struggle with it and to take the pushbacks that life gives you. Um, but this is not just about you and an individual experience. It is something that takes place in a culture, in a social context, and you, uh, and you grow in that social context, hopefully. So when I talk about Bildung, it is both knowledge about the world that people have taught you or you taught yourself from uh, reading or, or studying, and it's the life experience. It's your very personal take on it, development, your personal development, but it's also in a social context, so it's enculturation. Um, and now I will just go ahead with, uh, with the slides. So, uh, yes, The Nordic Secret. I spent two years uh, uh, writing that. Uh, Thomas Bjorkman, who you mentioned before, was the editor. Um, there's a thinner book here about Bildung. And then I wrote, as part of an Erasmus Plus project, this one uh, called What is Bildung? So if you want to read more about it and just want to go online and get started right away, uh, there is an online booklet. And there is also a, a five-page a uh, version of it that has been translated into Bulgarian and I don't know if it's there in Ukrainian, but it's definitely there in Russian. So uh, there are different, and German also, so there are different uh, uh, short versions of it. Um, I'm just going to jump to this picture and hope that, uh, that we can uh, keep it. And as I always do, I wonder, does anybody know who these three people are? Let's see if there are some... Uh, Western European stuff, that is, uh, so I can say that people in Germany uh, very often don't recognize them either. Uh, so that should be a hint. Does anybody want to try and guess who's on the pictures? So, uh, so the woman to the left, 
is uh, Rosa Parks. Um, anybody know who Rosa Parks was? She was uh, an American black woman in Alabama in the 1950s, and she kept her seat on the bus even though she was supposed to give it up to a white man. And that created a huge um, development in the civil rights movement in the United States. The two gentlemen here to the, to the right, uh, this is Goethe and this is Friedrich Schiller. And uh, they both lived uh, 300 years ago. And then of course, the question is, what would be the link between Goethe and Friedrich Schiller and Rosa Parks? And uh, in uh, 20 minutes, you will know. So, not shifted by itself. Um, we're going to go on a, on a time journey, and uh, Katerina just mentioned how rich and uh, successful the Nordic countries are. This is what the Nordic countries looked like 100 years ago. So, very different from today. Um, and sometimes it also looked like this. So, it wasn't just that we were born rich, uh, we created something that created that wealth, and that uh, had a huge impact on our societies. And uh, we got inspiration from Germany, and one of the people who's really essential in that history is the woman in the middle here. And I had never heard about her until I started researching and writing The Nordic Secret. Um, before she got married, her name was Anna Amelia von Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel. And I mostly say that because I like saying Wolfenbüttel. Um, she was... Um, she was uh, 18 years old when she got married to the Duke of Weimar. And uh, then she gave birth to those two sons, and then the husband died. But before he died, he testamented Weimar Eisenach to her, so she became the duchess and the uh, autocratic ruler of Weimar, which has a university town called Jena. And she was very progressive. She was a composer, she was an art patron, she um, was the ruler for, yeah, almost uh, 20 years before the oldest son, I suppose it's this guy, uh, turned 18 and took over the duchy. Um, it is a little bit confusing, I'm sorry that I have to keep such a, a steady eye uh, on, on the slides. So. Um, when this young man turned 18 and was about to take over the duchy, they needed to put together a cabinet for him. They needed to find uh, some ministers who could help him run the duchy. And there was a young uh, law student uh, who had just passed his bar exam, who uh, was uh, 24 years old in 1779 when, when he took over the duchy. And this young man had also written a novel that was extremely popular and actually caused a wave of suicides among young men across Europe. The young author and law uh, his name was Goethe. Uh, he wrote The Sufferings of Young Werder. And if we're talking youth culture and you know um, subcultures that suddenly catch everybody's attention. I would say that Goethe was the first teen idol in Europe. So he wrote this book about young Werder, who looked like this, uh, and couldn't get uh, the girl that he loved, and sh she broke up with him, and he killed himself because he was heartbroken. And this novel made Goethe a youth idol for like overnight. He was extremely popular, and that came out in 1774, and then five years later, uh, this young guy hires him. I, in a modern word, we would say they headhunted him as the prime minister of uh, Weimar Eisenach, and that was Goethe. And now we, uh, now we actually go to the slide, because in Weimar, they brought together all the uh, thinkers that are marked in white here. So one was Herder. He was actually a very good friend of Goethe. Uh, Friedrich Schiller joined in the 1780s and 90s. Wilhelm von Humboldt was there. He later started the university in Berlin. And then the philosopher Fichte and Hegel was in uh, Jena and Weimar uh, around uh, 1809 when Napoleon 
uh, came to, um, to Weimar and conquered it. So um, I have listed a number of uh, philosophers here because they are really central to the concept of Bildung. And I'm not going to get into too much of an academic uh, run through of all of them. But uh, this actually covers 200 no, 100 years of, uh, of thinking in Europe. The first one is Shaftesbury. And he was uh, British. He was an earl. He was the third earl of Shaftesbury. And he wrote about beauty. So he's actually the reason for the subtitle of the book. And he talked about three different kinds of beauty. And we, when we think about beauty, we probably think about good-looking people or good-looking things. And he said the first kind of beauty is exactly that good-looking people, good-looking things. So he kind of lumped them together. But there is a second kind of beauty, says Shaftesbury, which are the people who copy the good deeds. So doing good deeds and copying them from the right kind of people is beautiful. That is the second kind of beauty. The um, third kind of beauty is to be the kind of person that other people copy. So he actually talks about three kinds of being human, three kinds of being a beautiful human being. One of the um, uh, people who came after him uh, and wrote later was Hume, he was Scottish, and he was the first European to philosophize about what goes on in the mind when we think. When something, when we develop an opinion about something, what is it actually that goes on in the mind? If somebody comes from a Buddhist tradition, uh, they wouldn't be impressed by uh, Hume's writing in the 1740s. Uh, but, um, but for Europeans, this was brand new. And among the people who read Hume was Rousseau. And in 1762, he wrote the book Emile, which is most known for um, uh, talking about the, the free education of children or the free upbringing of children. And um, so a lot of people misunderstand the book and think that you just let the child run wild and learn from his experiences and then eventually he will turn out to be uh, a good human being. But that is not what Rousseau says. What he says is that there is an emotional and physical development in the child and the physical development from being born to being a toddler, a young child, an older child has a natural progression but so has the development of the mind and the emotions. And children aren't just unfinished adults. They're actually little human beings with a significant, important inner development uh, in themselves. You wonder who that handsome guy is. I know that we'll get to him in a moment. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry the PDF can't wait. So, um, that's... So, and after Rousseau wrote Emile, you could not be a thinker in Europe without reading Rousseau. That was like a Copernican turn in European thinking that what goes on inside us, our emotions are important. And we can't be whole human beings unless uh, our emotions are allowed to de develop naturally. Uh, so that is really what he was talking about. None of these three first uh, philosophers were in Jena and Weimar. But Goethe's good old friend Herder was there. And Herder wrote a book uh, also in 1774, the same year as Goethe wrote about Werder. Um, and Herder compared the development of civilization, of culture, to the emotional development of the individual. So he introduced the idea that cultures evolve. Cultures can become wiser. They can become more mature. They can make different kinds of decisions uh, based on their heritage and who they are and how they function. And, and there's a connection between what, how we can evolve and mature as individuals depending on the culture that we're in. Some cultures are more conducive for uh, personal maturity and building and development than other cultures. And actually Herder is the first one who writes about Bildung and makes it a secular thing. So he's really talking about Bildung as something that has nothing to do with religion. It's all your personal, emotional, and moral development. So Herder and Goethe are both in uh, Jena and Weimar uh, by around uh, 1780. They're best friends. Immanuel Kant is a very 
uh, famous for writing about, not Bildung, well, he is that as well, but one of his most famous essays is about what is enlightenment. Was ist Aufklärung? Uh, and he says, enlightenment is that you lift yourself out of your immaturity, out of your minority, and into majority, into maturity. And um, the interesting thing about him calling that enlightenment and not Bildung is that there is a philosopher who writes at exactly the same time, Moses Mendelssohn, about Bildung, enlightenment, and culture. Bildung, um, Aufklärung, Kultur, for those of you who speak German. Uh, and he says, those three go together. The interesting thing about these words is that ordinary people don't only book people, so writers like himself, use the three words Kultur, culture, enlightenment, and Bildung. And they are so new, we need to figure out what we actually mean by them. So they are in this new era where they think about something they'd never thought about before. What is culture? What does it mean to be enlightened? What is it that we're doing? And, um, and then there is, yoo Friedrich Schiller. Uh, finally, we get to the slide. So he talks about Bildung, and he says there are three kinds of people. So he's very inspired by Shaftesbury. He says um, the first kind of person uh, is the uh, person who is in the throes of his emotions. And he is not a free person because the emotions are constantly telling him what to do, and he cannot transcend that and uh, not do what his emotions are telling him to do. So he's not a free person. The second kind of person uh, has made the expectations of everybody around him the guiding norms for everything that he does. And because he always does what everybody else is expecting from him, he is not a free person either. The only person who is a free person is the person who can reconnect with his emotions and who has internalized the norms of society and therefore has two things going on inside him simultaneously. One thing is his own emotions and another thing is the expectations of others. When those two are aligned, aligned and say the same thing, life is easy. But very often what you feel and what other people expect are not the same and then you have an inner conflict. And then you have to choose. Do I follow my emotions or do I follow what other people expect? And that is when you're free as a human being because now you have a choice and you have to make up your mind what the kind of uh, decisions you make. And that is Friedrich Schiller. And particularly in a, a place that was under the Soviet Union for a long time, uh, this is interesting because the moment in time when Friedrich Schiller writes this is in the aftermath of the French Revolution. And the reason why he writes it is that the French Revolution caused so much hope in the bourgeoisie across Europe. Finally, the tyrant fell. We got rid of the French emperor, the French king. Now the French could have political freedom and then yoo-hoo, it would spread to Germany and the rest of Europe. But that was not what happened. It turned into a bloodbath. It turned into tyranny. And he said, so why could the French not handle political freedom? And that's when he came up with this. And he said, well, there's one kind of people. They are in the tr throes of their emotions. They're controlled by their emotions. So when they're angry and starving and want to kill the king, once they see blood, they want to see more blood. They can't stop. So they just are all, you know, in a rage. The second kind of people who does what other people expect from them, they're just going to follow the most angry people and participate in the bloodbath. You'll get to this uh, nice gentleman in a moment. So they will uh, participate in the bloodbath. So they cannot handle political freedom either. The only people who can handle political freedom are the people who are free themselves, who can both feel their own emotions and who have internalized the norms of society and can play by the rules of the group. And they are the ones who can handle political freedom because they are free on the inside. 
And the interesting thing in this context is that the process, according to Friedrich Schiller, is Bildung, and the result is Bildung. Um, so we can't have political freedom without Bildung, according to Friedrich Schiller. And how do we then make the transition? He says, so when you're all in under, you know, under your emotions, how do we get how do we get you aligned with society? Well, that's the aesthetics. It's beauty. It's the arts. It's music. It's uh, paintings, architecture, that makes you feel what people feel in society, and then you become one of the group. Then you become part of society. But when you're living according to everybody else's expectations and according to the norms of society. If you cannot transcend that, you're not free. Um, so you uh, need some other aesthetics, beauty, that can wake you up so you can feel your emotions again. And that is when you can become a free person. So that is Friedrich Schiller. And one of the people who read Friedrich Schiller was this um, Danish uh, theologian, Grundtvig. I'm just going to go back to some of the other thinkers here. This is Swiss pedagogue Pestalozzi, who wrote about the, pretty much the same thing as Friedrich Schiller. Then there was uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who actually started uh, the university in Berlin. And then we have Fichte. And Fichte is really interesting, also from uh, a modern perspective, because he says, so how do we do Bildung? And he said, Bildung comes from pushbacks, from resistance from running into unexpected things that force you to rethink, that force you to change your mind, things that surprise you, offend you, uh, shock you. That is when the Bildung takes place. So we can't have Bildung without a couple of unpleasant experiences from time to time. And then Hegel also writes about uh, Bildung. He's very difficult to understand, so I'm not going to get into his philosophy. So um, all of these German thinkers were, at least the ones in white, were in Jena and Weimar simultaneously and has had a huge impact on German culture. It has also had a huge impact on Danish culture because this Danish pastor read them and uh, was very inspired by them. And he was thinking, Hmm, this Bildung stuff. The Germans, they just want it for the bourgeoisie, but we need it throughout the entire population. It's not enough that the bourgeoisie has Bildung. The peasants need it too. Uh, he does not think much about the workers. He was a sort of a country kind of guy who was a pastor. Um, but he came up with the idea of folk building or popular building or bringing the people together through building and through learning about their history and who they were and their identity and their country. And so he came up with the idea of uh, folk building and the folk high schools. I, can, I hope you can see it on the slide here. Um, and the folk high school was basically just an idea. He, he, th he thought, so what should they learn? They should learn about their history, they should learn the Bible, and they should learn about the world so that they could become conscious citizens knowing what the, the world was about. Now I also think I'm losing sound. Um, and now it came back. Thank you. Um, so he uh, envisioned this folk high school and one of the reasons why he envisioned that was because it was important to him that Denmark had a strong sense of being Danish and that people, he was not a Democrat. He was actually very afraid of democracy because if you hand over the political power to people who do not have Bildung, he had read what, what might happen. So um, it was really important that if democracy came to Denmark, much against his intentions, at least the peasants and everybody would be ready for it. And that's why he wanted this folk building stuff and folk colleges or folk high schools. And to understand why that was so important, we need to look at geography and uh, you can see the Baltics there, but you can definitely see the, um, the Nordic countries and everything in red here, Norway and Denmark, was part of Denmark. So, ooh, Denmark was a big country, and Sweden was even bigger. It also had Finland in 1808. And the pink part down here at the bottom um, was two duchies owned by the Danish king, 
uh, and they were actually the richest part of Denmark because they were closer to Germany, they were industrialized earlier, and they wanted to maybe leave Denmark and become German so that they could become more prosperous and become part of the Industrial Revolution rather than being poor peasants like the rest of Denmark. And the Danes were not too happy about that. So, slides. Um, uh, as part of the Napoleonic Wars, and now we'll get the slide, um, Russia took Finland, uh, and in the peace negotiations, Sweden got Norway instead by the English, because Denmark was on the side of Napoleon, and the British didn't like that. So Denmark lost Norway, and that was a shock. And so how do we compensate for losing all of this land? Well, we need to send the peasants to folk high school so that they know what it means to be Danish, because if the Germans come back and take the rest, at least they will know where they belong. So there was a, a deliberate effort to create a sense of Danish awareness down here, and they built a folk high school, and it was incredibly boring. Uh, the young farmers who went there hated it. It was a two-year program and very expensive and uh, not success. And then we actually did get into a war with Germany uh, in 1848. And I'm not just saying this to present war history, but also because I see what's going on in Ukraine right now and how the war is creating a, a collective sense of self. And that is what happened to Denmark. And I bet it also happened uh, during the Soviet era um, or after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, uh, during the war, there's a young woman here. It's not Greta Thunberg. Her name is Mathilde Fiebiger. She writes a novel about what it means to be a young girl during wartime. And she has a friend who is very different from herself. And this is what she writes about her. And let's see uh, if I... Yeah, there, yeah, there he goes. So, she writes about her friend that she is passionate about little things. I about the grand ones. I love all the soldiers, so all the Danish soldiers are fighting the Germans as brothers because they fight for our common cause. She only cares about the cause because she knows a couple of the very handsome officers. So these are two very different girls. And it's obvious that one of the girls is sort of in the throes of her emotions. The other girl who um, is depicted here is identifying with the entire country and with what it means to be Danish. But the interesting thing is that young Matilda is 19 years old when she writes this, and she is capable of seeing these two different ways of being in the world and describing them as two very different kinds of character. This gentleman uh, wanted so bad to fight the Germans in the war between 1848 and 1851. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately enough, he was too clumsy to load the guns, so the army did not want to have him, which was very traumatic for him because he really wanted to fight for Denmark. Instead, he um, ended up buying this farmhouse and establishing a folk high school. He was a teacher, and he did three brilliant things, and they're all related to Bildung. The first thing about this uh, folk high school that he created was that uh, it should be homey. It should feel comfortable for the young men to be there. They could not be intimidated while being there. So this farmhouse was very much like the farmhouses they normally lived in. Nothing fancy. Everybody ate porridge out of the same bowl morning, midday, and, and evening. They had separate spoons, but they had the same bowl. He also realized that... Um, when he used to teach children, and he taught them what he was supposed to teach them, nobody paid attention. So they didn't listen. But when he told them stories, they listened. So he started by telling stories to his young... The, the, the men there were between the age of 18 and 25. So um, he told them stories from the Bible. He told them... Uh, stories from uh, the Danish history, and he uh, read patriotic novels for them. And once they listened and he had their attention, he started asking questions. And in 1851, that was radical. Nobody used to ask young farmhands anything. 
And then once they started asking him questions, uh, he asked them questions, they asked him questions. They were interested in the answer. And so he could actually teach them stuff. And this was a huge new thing for those young men who went there. And they started thinking, maybe I can express myself. Maybe I have things to offer the world. Maybe I can think for myself and be interest I interested in my opinion. So it's a totally new way of pedagogy. Final really brilliant stroke that uh, Kristen called as his name was came up with was that there could be no exams. The only reason you go to one of these schools would be to um, because you want to be there, you want to learn. Um, they were boarding schools. They were um, uh, uh, they worked at the school and they sang together, worked together, and lived together, and so they learned together as well. Very popular with the young men who went there. Uh, hard to sell a concept to anybody else until we got into Germany in this time with uh, uh, Bismarck, and we lost uh, the <laughs> that pink area uh, down there. Uh, so all that was left was this part of Denmark, and that was a shock to the Danes. And that is when uh, the folk high schools became a movement. So the next year, 1865, there was like 11 schools starting in 1866, uh, 17 schools starting, and then uh, they paid attention to it in Sweden and Norway, where the first school started actually in 1863, Sweden 1868, Finland 1889, and of all the people who started a folk high school in uh, uh, Finland, 13, uh, 12 of them, 13 of them had been to a Danish folk high school. So this is a, a Danish uh, export success to the other Nordic countries. And what we have done with this is that uh, where the rest of Europe had peasants that were very often illiterate, we actually uh, not just taught everybody to read and write, we also encourage them to uh, develop uh, their own viewpoints, go to a folk high school, and it was uh, around 10% of the annual uh, cohort that went to a folk high school in Denmark in the 1880s and 90s and onwards. And it has and, um, and now there's a little bit of, of uh, statistics here, um, because this has had an impact, because the Nor Nordic countries used to be among the poorest in Europe. So I do not have the Baltics here, but I do have Switzerland. They were always among the richest countries. This is a GDP per capita. Uh, here we have the rich countries in Europe. That is the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, France. Uh, same uh, pattern here, different, different numbers, Switzerland and the rich countries. I'm just going back here. Uh, then we have the poor countries, and that is Portugal, Spain, uh, Greece, Italy, and Austria-Hungary. That's the big fat black line here. I, R Russia had the same development. And they remained poor over the course of the 1800s. But then you have Denmark. It starts out among the poorest countries, but then it starts climbing, particularly here around the 1860s uh, and 70s, or actually earlier here. And then they become we become one of the rich countries. And then you have... Uh, Sweden doing the same thing. And then you have Norway taking off from the poor countries and becoming a rich country. And then Finland is poor as long as they're under Russia. Funny how that works. Um, and from they get their freedom in uh, uh, 1918, they make a journey to become one of the richest countries as well. So something happens in the Nordics. And here's a different data set showing the same thing. Uh, you can s see the Nordic countries, poor, 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 and then whoops, climbing to the top of the economy. So we did something right in the Nordic countries. Um, and it's hard to say that uh, the folk high schools were the reason for this, that this is the Nordic secret, and we cannot rerun history and prove it. So where do we look for evidence? And, um, and we can look to the United States, and in the 1920s, there was an economic crisis in the United States, and um, this teacher, Miles Horton, decided that uh, he needed a different kind of adult education. I'm just trying to hold the, the picture here, um, because 
the black people were extremely poor in Tennessee where he was, and the white people were extremely poor as well, the, the workers and the, the unskilled workers. So he needed some kind of adult education that and he heard about the folk high schools in Denmark, and he went to Denmark and studied the folk high schools, and went back to uh, the United States and started what he called Highlander Folk School in 1932. And at Highlander Folk School was, um, in the 1950s, Rosa Parks, there she is, and also Martin Luther King Jr. And they were part of the civil rights movement in the United States. And Rosa Parks has said that if it wasn't for those, she was just at, at Highlander Folk School for two weeks, but it gave her the moral courage. And she has said if it wasn't for Highlander, she would not have had the courage to keep her seat on the bus. It gave her a sense of being fully human um, and of, um, of, of daring to, uh, to, to count herself as somebody had the same rights as, as a white person. So that is what you can also do with Bildung and folk high schools, and that is uh, the Nordic secret. Um, so I, I could I could talk more, but I think I will I will stop here, and uh, hand on the, the microphone to uh, to Katerina, and maybe switch the uh, slides to something else that doesn't move, and then. Uh, don't go away, Lene. I, I'd, I'd like to use the opportunity and ask at least one question and then pass the floor to the next speaker. Um, and I know it's a philosophical question. So based on what you said, a person might have political, might, might be given, offered political freedom only in case he or she controls his or her emotions, or is able to control, is able to manage at least, uh, and then has internalized social norms. How would you evaluate the situation of the world population today? How many people are ready for the political freedom so that our democracies would be true democracies of mature people. So I, I would definitely not want to uh, estimate how many people are ready for this. Um, but yay, <laughs> I would like to say that um, we can't run around testing people for their emotional maturity and their ability to handle political freedom. That is why it's so important that we have schools who focus on this so that everybody has, who has gone to school has a sense of um, knowing where they, where they belong, having a sense of responsibility and identification with the society that they're in, that they have uh, an aesthetic, uh, connection to other people that they can, as you call it, uh, sort of contain their own emotions and not be overwhelmed by them, at least not all the time, um, and who can take responsibility and who have, when they turn 18 and get the right to vote, that inner conflict between uh, what my emotions say and, and what society says, hopefully they're aligned very often, but from time to time they must uh, be different because that's what it means to be an adult human being. Sometimes you want something else than everybody around you and you need to be able to handle that and you need to be able to talk about it in a meaningful way. Um, so, so that is, uh, so therefore it's so crucial that education has this building component and the way that things are right now in the world a lot of people are longing for a strong guy to fix things. And um, whenever Putin has been riding around uh, bare-chested or fighting tigers or trying to convince us that he's the world champion of judo or whatever it is, um, just thinking of any Western politician, prime minister, head of state, you know, getting on a horse 
and showing you know their bare chest in order to convince us that that he should be the leader of I don't know Sweden Denmark Brussels or something like that it's just so freaking ridiculous so there's a completely different mindset um, Trump and Putin uh, have some of the same uh, characteristics uh, Lukashenko of course so I think that there's a natural inclination uh, to look for authorities who give us clear answers. It feels comfortable uh, as we grow up and as we come of age if somebody tells us what the world is like and what it should be like. But at some point, you need to break away from that as an adult and say, no, I need to participate in the mess that is politics. I need to accept that this is difficult. It's uncomfortable. There are hard decisions. Part of having a modern society is that we will disagree. Not everybody wants what I want. I definitely do not want what everybody else wants. Not all, all the time, at least. We need to have the building, the emotional maturity that allows us to appreciate that other people want something else than I want, and they want to live their life in a different way than I want. And that is where we need to be able to have the civilized conversation, and that is part of Bildung. And what we have done with the folk high schools in the Nordics is that we have trained young people in realizing that the other students who are at the folk high school and who want something completely different than I do, it can be their sexuality, it can be their political viewpoints, it can be their dreams with regards to a career, it can be all kinds of lifestyles. I may meet somebody who has values and lifestyles that are so different from mine, it's really hard to handle. But I simultaneously may also experience that this person is really kind, is great fun to be with, uh, shares my interest in, I don't know, computer games, collecting stamps, whatever it is. So there is an identification nevertheless. And so that is what you can do when you focus on building an education so that vertical development, life experience, and not just the horizontal transfer of knowledge. And that is what we have specialized in in the, in the folk high schools, and we have done it for, yeah, 170 years now. And, uh, and it's still about 10% of all young people in the Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, who go to a folk high school. Sweden, Finland, the folk high schools have sort of developed in a slightly different direction, but it's still the core idea behind the folk high schools in Sweden and uh, Finland, that they do something different than the formal school system. It's not just a transfer of knowledge. It is how you relate to it, how you relate to yourself how you relate to the world and how you have moral aspirations and sort of stretching your emotional muscle so you can become a full human being. Um, so yeah, and, and uh, that is uh, at the, the base of any functioning democracy. So um, we need that. Let me ask you one more question shortly. Today I had a, a meeting with a person who is um, a Buddhist monk for like 30 years. And while explaining, uh, and I, during this conversation, although the person is quite uh, dear to me, like I feel a lot of warmth towards her, but um, we had a, some conversation around some hot issue related to the war in Ukraine. And then there was a point that I was super triggered by when she said, I'm just, I'm out of politics. I do not want to go into depth into these issues. I'm out of politics. And uh, I've, um, I had this very controversial, very ambiguous uh, feeling because part of me uh, respects and trains my muscle of an inclusive and tolerant and, um, uh, you know, yeah, warm attitude and mind that can embrace complexity, including people who choose certain paths and exclude certain topics from their um, horizons. At the same time, as a Ukrainian, and I feel like no Ukrainian has a privilege to be out of politics now. 
So I'm wondering why should other nations be out of politics? Um, because it's so like interconnected with everyday life, at least in, in, in the context of me and my compatriots. So I get really triggered by this. So my question to you, how do you envision this? And also I have a judgment for that, just to let you know, I call it spiritual bypassing, sorry. <laughs> There's a term, it's, an, it's a, I'm, I'm not um, a kind of, um, I do not want to seem arrogant, you know, putting labels on people, but that, that was a thought crossing my mind. I was like, this is not true spirituality um, when you exclude politics from your life. So my question to you, Lena, what is your view on it? Whether politics and spirituality can, uh, can make friends and go together? They must go together. Uh, one of the interesting things about the folk high schools in Denmark uh, when they started in the 1860s was that it, it was about politics, it was also about spirit. Uh, it was about saving the Danish spirit, what we would call uh, maybe uh, Danish culture today, uh, identity, all the things that go into identifying as a Dane. So history, uh, storytelling, songs, cultural heritage. and um, the, the nourishment of the spirit or of the mind, of the soul, whatever we want to call it in a secular context, is part of Bildung. And you can't, you can only get Bildung if you go out into the world and encounter it. You, you need to spend time at home and thinking about things as well, but you cannot think your way to Bildung. You have to go out there and risk making mistakes and risk doing things right, and take responsibility, and succeed and fail. That's where things happen. And part of the price of having political freedom, and living in freedom, and having all kinds of choices throughout your day, and the freedom to actually be a Buddhist monk in a non-Buddhist country, comes from somebody else taking political responsibility. So you're getting a free ride if you don't want to engage. There are many ways of doing that, uh, but at least you need to, uh, to, to um, be interested and, and follow what goes on in politics and vote. But you can also be politically active in other ways and volunteer, and it doesn't mean that you have to have explicit, you know, write opinion pieces in the news or be explicitly politic, political but you do need to be engaged as, as a citizen and take that responsibility upon you. And one of the things that I think we managed to create with Bildung, folk Bildung, folk high schools in the Nordics, and actually this has influenced our other parts of the school system, primary school, secondary school, the whole formal school system, is a way of looking at the individual as somebody who must become a citizen with Bildung. It has been in our uh, public school legislation for generations that we don't just educate for the job market. Now we do, and that's terrible, but it used to be that Danish schools were for uh, developing uh, citizens uh, that could handle democracy. And so it's, it's a conscious effort, and, uh, and we've seen it all. Um, a question to you guys based on, now we will check uh, how the presentation landed with you. Um, what made Cold, Christian Cold so successful? How he actually c could get, could grasp the minds of, of young people? What did he do? What did he, what did Cold do? All the previous teachers were unsuccessful, as you may remember, because they were just pouring the knowledge into the children, like young people's minds. And what did Cold, what was the difference? Yeah, so what did he do? Ask questions and told stories, exactly. So I would like to introduce you a great storyteller, like one of the best storytellers in my life um, is Sergei Chumachanko. 
And <laughs> um, yeah, there, there are more. Uh, he's pointing to Irena Pranskevichuti, and I would say yes, yes. There, there might be some uh, competition. Uh, maybe one, one day we will, we will do something like that. But <laughs> uh, at the moment, I'd like to invite Serhii. Serhii is a friend. He ha comes from Ukraine. He uh, has a background in, um, actually, in many things. He, if I may, and please correct me if, when I'm wrong, right? When, yes, when I make a mistake about you, talking about you. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. So, uh, Sergei has the second. Okay, so it's working. The second microphone is working. Thank you. Thank, uh -huh. you. Thank you. Great. So, Sergei has um, military background, like long, long time ago. He was studying in Riga in, uh, in Latvia. And then he has a lot of experience with working in um, an NGO called the Saviors Union, right? He was the one who was helping to instruct uh, and save people in the mountains and in, uh, in the, um, also in the marine, I, I believe. Uh, later, it also, uh, he also learns that. So he was the, but, but yeah, yeah okay. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I, I told you, but your, your son does it. So it's for me, it's like the, the, the whole family is, um, um, is, you know, pieces of the puzzle. Uh, but it's all about helping people to uh, be physically safe. And at the same time, uh, uh, so he has been evolving as a, as a professional who started to move from the teams uh, in this uh, savior setting into the business setting. So he started about 15 years ago, I believe. He started to work with corporations, with big companies, with NGOs, um, in order to foster trust, cooperation, and effective communication within the teams. And he used a lot of his expertise as a savior, as a guard, as someone who um, has the embodied experience and at the same time conveys the embodied experience, like involves body into the process of building trust. And he was a very successful trainer. And then something happened. And I will stop here and pass the floor to Serhii. And then we would like to see, hear the story. Uh, and um, the story, j just to finish my, th my thought, would be both about his, his tr evolution, his transition, and something we are extremely proud of as Ukrainians, connected to what you, you just heard from Lene. Um, how the concept of Bildung, through one person, and from one personal and professional story, unfolded into something extremely inspirational, and hopefully, with time, will be very successful in our beloved country. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, okay. I don't know how to be the good storyteller after such presentation of me. Uh, what's about my presentation? Can we... Uh, Katerina asked me to do my presentation in English. That's why the most important things you can see in English on my presentation. Um, you see on the picture of, of, of this event, uh, there are four people. Uh, three of them are ladies with a good English, and uh, the fourth is some different from these three ladies. Uh, he is a man, and he uh, not so good in English. Поэтому давайте будем українською. Ну, якщо я вже приїхав у Вільнюс, да, то то тут ви англійською нас спілкуєтесь вже і без мене. А я вже буду українською, ну щоб не мучити не перекладача, не ні Лено. Anderson and uh, uh, okay, guys, understand uh, the floor is mine. That's why I was speaking that language that that I won't speak in this moment. Yeah, okay. 
А, я вибачаюсь, да, там, там просто ви то всі, які розуміють англійську, вже буду англійською, а підключиться перекладач, там будемо вибирати. Якщо if you will be, if you will be, if my English will be so bad that you can't listen this blah 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 blah, you will say and I'll speak, speak in Ukraine or Russian, okay? Okay. Катерина uh, uh, asked me to uh, tell you about my story, how I connect with Bildung. Uh, it's uh, uh, some interesting story, but when I hear uh, Lena Anders, I, I thought that maybe um, it's better another presentation to show about the, this moment here yeah, in Ukraine, because uh, all that I will show you here is more about folk high school, Ukrainian folk high school in war time. Uh, it's not so about uh, uh, building, about folk building in Ukraine, uh, but somewhat I will, I will uh, say about this. Um, in 2010, I read the very interesting book, Lawrence Harrison, Who Prosper. Uh, this book is a result of 20-year researchers. Uh, Lawrence Harrison is an uh, economist and, uh, uh, and uh, very favorite, uh, favorite uh, expert in uh, humanitarian science. And this book was the result of 20 years research of uh, Latin America countries. And uh, as a result of uh, these 20 years uh, re research work, uh, he wrote uh, that uh, the main thesis of Harrison is that the culture is the dominant factor influ uh, influencing the progress and development of groups and nations. National culture is the main core uh, of the chance of uh, success uh, any countries and uh, any, any um, nations. Lawrence uh, Harrison used uh, four factors matrix uh, for analyzing the national culture of North uh, America countries and uh, Latin America countries. Uh, here are the, uh, these four factors. The first uh, is uh, radius of trust. Uh, the second, what is power used for personal enrichment or development of the common good? Uh, the third, uh, rigidity of rules and moral system. And the fourth, uh, attitude to work, innovation, saving, profit, and uh, uh, what is the main for the nation, the, nation uh, the history of the nation or the future of the nation? Uh, what is the orienteering of mindset of, of the nation in the history or in the, uh, you know, some, uh, maybe some archetypical things or in the uh, unknown future? Uh, when we used this matrix to Analyzing Ukrainian culture, we uh, it was one of the best days in my bad days in my life because we understood that Ukrainian haven't a big chance to be successful, successful uh, because uh, you understand it was in 2012 that we have rather little uh, radius of trust. Power used uh, for personal en enrichment. Uh, in our country, uh, uh, Ukrainians don't like rules. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, and only the third factor is you know, something, something about Ukrainians. We like to job, we like the profit, and uh, in, in this honor we have some, some, some chance to be successful, successful uh, in, this world, in this world. Um, in, uh, if we see some, uh, uh, some line uh, of the um, chance of success, uh, uh, the Harrison wrote that gaiety haven't any chance, uh, because on this line, they, this, they have minus 26 bars, 
<coughs> Norwegian, Sweden, and uh, northern countries have plus 26 uh, balls and have uh, all chance to be successful, and they are successful, really. And Ukraine have had uh, plus six balls. Points, points, yeah. Uh <coughs> it was rather... Uh, Rather interesting the situation, and uh, from that time, I looked for some humanitarian technology or, uh, social, or, or social technology that can change national Ukrainian culture uh, to be more successful in the western part of the world. Uh, oh here is the main problem. Uh, this presentation I showed two days ago on uh, European Building Dance of, of Lena Anderson, and uh, three weeks ago uh, on the meeting of uh, Northern Folk Building Council. Uh, this is the association of, uh, of the folk uh, high school associations of all northern countries. Uh, this is a little uh, points that described the main problems of our Ukrainian society. Uh, okay, <coughs> let's go. And uh, in 2016, we created with Katerina Yasko a very interesting program of reteaching uh, Ukrainian teachers from eastern part of Ukraine. And the end of that program was the visit uh, to Sw Sweden. Uh, ten Ukrainian uh, children, ten Ukrainian teachers uh, went to, to, the, to the Sweden. Uh, yeah, uh, one of them is Tatiana. Yeah, uh, this is a product of our program. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, in 2016, I faced the first uh, time with such phenomenon as the Folk High School. It was Biskop Sarna Folk High School in uh, Sweden. I don't understand anything, absolutely. They haven't examined in, in the start of this process, in the end. They haven't any control of, of the kind of uh, education. Uh, they have so much freedom in this process that, that it was something absolutely fantastic for Ukrainian teacher or for Ukrainian educator. And I feel, feel there that uh, I saw uh, some artifact of such humanitarian technology that changed uh, the Nordic culture and the Nordic society. Uh, in 2018, I uh, wrote the thesis that really uh, Nordic countries has uh, such kind uh, of humanitarian technology. Um <coughs> I have uh, a conversation with the prof professor Krikunov in uh, Ukraine, uh, I said that I have such uh, uh, hip hypothesis, hypothesis, yeah? hypothesis, yeah, and he said, yes, really, I see that uh, you may be true. Uh, let's begin the academic uh, research of these questions, and uh, um, after after this conversation, that conversation, I wrote in the Google research. Uh, <coughs> humanitarian techno technology of Nordic countries, what is. Uh, and the first link was to the uh, book of uh, Lena and Thomas Bjorkman, The Nordic Secret. And when I began to read this book, I understood that really, I am true, the Nordic countries really have such kind of social transformation technology. It's named in any country by any mm, kind of uh, uh, definitions, uh, especially in Sweden it's uh, uh in Denmark, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's Folkeoplusing. Yeah, yeah? Uh, true? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Th thank you, teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, in Finland, it's Sivistius. It's very interesting uh, definition that means uh, what we must to do to be civilization. Uh, and um, the main problem of uh, definitions in this sphere is that um, there are no clear translator for any kind of language from Nordic languages. Uh, <coughs> and uh, in that time I understood why 
uh, Lena used uh, this German uh, word Bildung because uh, no, because we have haven't any um, another variant to do this information using the global Europe and the uh, uh, whole world. And from 2019, I began to research this uh, phenomenon. And I, uh, as Katerina said, I stopped my business. I stopped my training work. Uh, I stopped all kinds of projects. And from 2019. Uh, all that I do, I'm researching, researching, researching this unique uh, phenomenon of uh, Nordic countries. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, not only I started this process in the beginning of uh, uh, 21st century, uh, the North America is propustiva, uh, missed this phenomenon, and they began to be interested in this phenomenon uh, from academic uh, cycles only in the last years of uh, 19th year, so 20th century. But now all the biggest universities in the North, in the United States have uh, the institute or library of researching of this phenomenon of uh, Nordic countries. They uh, understand now that uh, it's something unique, it's something very, very important, and they need this kind of education too. Uh, from that time, uh, we uh, created some non-government organizations, especially in 2018, uh, <coughs> we started the uh, um, group in Facebook that named uh, Ukrainian Folk School. Um, it, it's happened uh, during the first uh, uh, the event of first uh, integration day, yeah? yeah? Yeah, Ukrainian integral meeting. Uh, I had only 10 minutes for presenta presentation. What is uh, for high schools? Uh, but I have presentations, 142 slides. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's impossible to show these slides during 10 minutes. But the people asked uh, to continue, and during this meeting, uh, was created this full group uh, uh, in 20 in the end of 2018 it was uh, 25 participants in this group but now we have 800 people from 10 countries uh, we um, publish in this group all, all the biggest part of our uh, translation from uh, Nordic country researchers articles uh, books and uh, many many others then we uh <coughs> created the um, non-government uh, organization Ukrainian Builders Network uh, and the last uh, uh, in 2020 uh, my wife said that she understood that uh, we wouldn't be happy family uh, if he uh, wouldn't uh, support me in this morning moment <laughs> and I began to looking for the building for the first folk high school in Ukraine. Uh, during one year I saw many kinds of school in Ukraine from the eastern part to western part. It's near 40 schools I, I saw, 40 buildings in any regions of Ukraine. And in 2021, in February 2021, we both, we bought, both, bought? Uh, two buildings of old school in Chernigov uh, uh, region uh, and from that time we are um, very closely to the realization of this idea in Ukraine. Uh, <coughs> here is the two kinds of emblem for the uh, first Ukrainian folk high school. Uh, we uh, <coughs> We asked our villagers, uh, Vapchok is the name of Ukrainian village in Chernihov uh, region, what kind of uh, uh, emblem they like more. Uh, I thought that uh, they will choose the wolf uh, because, because Vapchok is a little wolf, wolf. But they said, no, it's, uh, for them it's more interesting this kind of uh, uh, emblem on my shirt, this uh, emblem. Uh, this is the Kyrillic uh, uh, letter V. Uh, and uh, in this variant, uh, there is the uh, letter B of the, the first letter of the word Bildung. Uh, 
Uh, and the, uh, the second part is the first letter of, of the word uh, liberty. Uh, that's the soul of idea of folk schooling, really. Um, <coughs> Uh, I don't know uh, how we need to know to, to know something about village. Not a big village, uh, 500 uh, inhabitants. Now only 40 uh, place for work, not more. Um, only two or three uh, in, oh, three entrepreneurs in, in, in this village. Uh, and the young people went from this village to the big city or abroad of Ukraine because they, they um, haven't uh, haven't perspective in, in this in this place. This is really of, of this village. Uh, it's not far far from uh, Kiev, near 90 kilometers uh, from Kiev, 45 kilometers from the center of Chernigov. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it's interesting uh, the connection with the history of uh, northern countries. Uh, near this pla place, near our school, there are two big Vikings settlements of 10th century. Uh, and we have many other artifacts of Nordic uh, culture and Nordic history in this place, especially. Uh, all is okay, good uh, folk art traditions, a big national park near this. Uh, one of the biggest uh, in Ukraine uh, near this village. This is, uh, you see on this picture, these two buildings. Uh, the stone building, uh, building is 1920, yes, uh, built. Uh, and this little wood uh, building is an old church uh, school. It's uh, nine, oh, 1886 years uh, built. Uh, some picture of our school, uh, the real situation with these uh, buildings, many problems. Uh, in uh, 2021, we renovation uh, the roof of these two buildings. It's near 1,000 square meters. Uh, and um, now, uh <coughs> now about the period from 23 Feb of 2022. Uh, when the, uh, this active fast uh, uh, started, oh, oh yeah, uh, sorry, I'm in trauma, I'm from Ukraine now, this is why it's rather hard to speak about, about this, this time, about this period. We stopped all our uh, works in this school, um, and uh, we started the project uh, uh, of preparing the instructors in and trainers in tactical medicines. Why? Because uh, Katerina said that I was uh, the head of mountain rescue service. My son is a very good rescuer mountain and uh, he was uh, very good prepared in this topic, in topic of pre-medical helping and uh, tactical medicine before the war. I, when the war uh, started, he started the project uh, of preparing military in the topic of tactical medicine, and he asked me to look for uh, some a foreign poor partner who can uh, study and uh, 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 license, uh, not license, uh, teach and certification, yeah, certification in the topic of tactical medicine, our guys, uh, thanks to our contacts of uh, uh, Nordic Building Network, uh, rather quickly we, uh, we, look, uh, we mm, found here yeah, the partner in Sweden, this is the Special State Emergency Agency, MSB. Um, we have, we had uh, negotiations uh, with many countries, especially Polish, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, United States of America, GB, but all our uh, partners said that they can't go to the uh, war country and uh, they are ready to prepare our guys only abroad of Ukraine. 
but in military times we uh, haven't such possibility to send our boys from territory of Ukraine to another country. And only Swedish uh, rescuers uh, said that, uh, that they are all understand and they are ready to go to Ukraine and began this big work for preparing these, these uh, peoples. And uh, we started our process of renovation work because we very good understand, understood that Vobchok uh, one of the best place for preparing trainers and instructors in this topic. Um, <coughs> uh, by the vision of our architecture, uh, we have uh, three stage of renovation work. Uh, it's a pity, but today I have information that he is dead. Uh, and this work will continue without our architecture. It's some, some interesting travel for me. <laughs> some uh, not good uh, news uh, from many points. Um, but the first stage of uh, this uh, repair work um <coughs> includes the construction of a hostel for 16 people, uh, construction of shores and toilets, uh, construction of a place for mini cafe, uh, and construction of two cl classroom toilets and uh, kitchen in a wooden building. Uh, this uh, first stage um, provides an opportunity to conduct training for 16 people and it's rather good uh, start place for the for our project in tactical medicine questions. I'll go. This is about the second uh, stage, third stage. Uh, for this moment, our family invest uh, one hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars in this project, uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, then will be uh, many pictures about our school. This is uh, old. Uh, wooden school before the renovation work and after the renovation work. Before, after, uh, very many light is uh, not good uh, picture. This is an old, old uh, classroom, this is a new classroom. Uh, many jobs we did. 70% uh, of, of the first state are, uh, are ready. Uh, but uh, mm, we financed this project by our own business, uh, the family business in Kharkiv region, and in war time we, it, the business stopped, and we can't possibility to continue this work with renovation uh, our school. Uh, Officially, registration of our school uh, was uh, in July 2022, and uh, the next slide is about our cooperation with Swedish Civil Contingency Cont Agency in the field of uh, tactical medicine. During this year, our Swedish uh, partners trained uh, 65 instructors and trainers in tactical medicine. Uh, and these 65 uh, Ukrainian instructors uh, teach uh, 15,000 people in Ukraine, uh, 12,000 uh, militaries, and uh, the rest part is the civilian. Uh, from the uh, May of 2022 till the end of uh, 2022, it was only one project uh, where we uh, teach uh, the most militants. But from December um, 2022, we started another project that names uh, Civil Protection Faculty. And this is the line uh, where our instructors uh, te teaching only civilian people, rescuers, sub uh, deminers, uh, and uh, firefighters. Uh, there are some pictures from the uh, training. Uh, this training is only for de-occupied villages on the northern part of uh, Kyiv region and Chernigov, Chernigov region. And the, our main task to prepare in uh, any village uh, the team that will have uh, all knowledge and all staff uh, to help other villagers uh, 
uh, during the rocket uh, artillery uh, missiles and many of these peoples, many of these villages are on the territory uh, where are very many mines and uh, uh, explore ordinance. This is why it's uh, uh, very danger for their life uh, and these knowledge are very important for these uh, peoples. Uh, this is a work with civilians, uh, this is a work with firefighters, um, another situation with firefighters, uh, many trainings with uh, civilian pe people and firefighters today. Um, our team uh, teach 22% of rescuers and firefighters of Kyiv region. Uh, the big part of them are um, regularly go to uh, another region uh, for work. Uh, on rotation principles, uh, especially Kyiv's deminers uh, work in Kherson region. Uh, and our team began uh, to teach the deminers uh, in the Porozhye in and Kherson region. Uh, <coughs> this is very interesting uh, picture. Uh, it wasn't in, in, in uh, presentation uh, two days ago. Uh, this is the Parisia city. Uh, and the team of deminers uh, came back uh, from the um, very danger region, uh, and they have only two days for, for this training. And the um, young man who came from this uh, business trip asked us uh, if he can to invite, invite Nivesta. Uh, He's fancy. Fiance. I don't know how to English here. Uh, yes, of course. You said uh, her name, Lubov. Uh, on, on <laughs> here is the uh, Ukrainian word Lubov, uh, and it was uh, mm, very fa fantastic свидание uh, date, yeah, uh, because they haven't time to to, to date and to only only one. Uh, chance is, is to be the past participant of this uh, training. This is the last training yesterday uh, for rescuers of uh, Kherson region. Mm, these our guys uh, help firefighters un under the uh, rocket strike in Kharkiv. Um, this is our school. There was uh, uh, two training for civilian and uh, two days training for uh, military doctors. Uh, this is a photo from this training, from this old uh, building. Uh, our instructors mm, prepared the military doctors. Uh, here is another picture. Uh, uh, this is my son Vlad and he, his team work uh, near the Bakhmut. Uh, they uh, teach uh, the military instructors and the military doctors. I don't uh, sure that uh, I can show you uh, photos from the front line. Are you ready for this now? Okay. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, ready. Good. Uh, mm, the last that I want to say is a uh, very interesting case. In these uh, deoccupied villages, when our guys stopped uh, their training after the training, uh, the local people uh, came to our instructors and asked them to continue the study. It's some fantastic situation because before the war we thought that these people uh, don't need uh, education, don't need development, but now uh, the war started absolutely another process in, in our Ukrainian society. And they asked uh, to continue uh, this process of development of uh, local commune. I proposed uh, two topics for continue. The first one is uh, uh, psychological work, how to help one another under the pushing of stress. Uh, and uh, the second talk is the uh, storytelling about future, talk about future. What do you think, uh, what was their choice? Yeah, of course, of course, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all of them said that 
they very, very, very need to talk about future because this is the base of stability, of resilience. Uh, this is the base of their motivation. That's why we uh, started uh, the process of preparing this talk. Uh, we looked uh, for the case of Fiskars Village in Finland uh, as a model for development local tourism cluster. For them, the one of the m my main task in this uh, trip uh, to looking for Lithuanian uh, local commune that will be ready to be a partner of our Valshok village in this process. Uh, this is a story about how in the war time the topic of tactical medicine opened the door uh, for democ democracy, for building uh, for Ukrainian society. Thank you. Yep, sorry. I'd just like to note that we just heard a piece of, of theory uh, and of course uh, Lena's life uh, is, is full of application and practice. But, uh, and, and still, after that, we heard uh, a piece that illustrates a lot of practice. And um, we have one more guest speaker today, who is coming from Lithuania. So first was from Denmark, next one from Ukraine, and then now we have a Lithuanian friend. Um, and I would like to ask a question. Irena was the uh, main organizer of the European Bildung Days and she was someone uh, Lena has leaned on preparing for this important event that took place on May 8th and 9th. So yesterday was the last day and uh, it was a quite successful kind of conference where people from all over Europe came to exchange. Uh, primarily the Bildung practitioners. Um, and um, frankly speaking, I didn't hear much about Bildung uh, in Lithuania, as I mentioned. And still Vilnius becomes the, the city that hosts the European, European Bildung Conference. Uh, and everything usually starts from concrete personalities. Someone just takes responsibility and does something. And uh, Irena, I have a personal question why you did it? You have a personal answer. <laughs> um, I really truly belong to quite broad international community that relates to building from United States and, and from Scandinavia and my biggest building or really human development, my, 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 uh, I might say my, my pain and enlightenment resources, my friends, are my friends from Ukraine since 2016. And uh, myself, I was drawn for some period of life into quite theoretical discussions with great minds in the world uh, around uh, development of psychology, about development of society. And myself, I'm a doer, as also many Lithuanians, they are doers, how I see them. Uh, so it always was a question, it's great, I truly fond of, of, of it all, of all these great books and great minds, but when it goes to some shady parts in, uh, in your life, uh, with difficult children or complicated societies or even myself in, in, in some uh, complicated situations. So how I can apply this? Uh, do <laughs> 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 Yes. <so laughs> Yes, so okay, uh, I'm often not so sad, but I feel quite sad around this uh, topic. So I really was thinking how, how all these great ideas, thoughts about developed societies and me being in those troops of those 
and the really wise people around, around, how we can do this in practice. And isn't the worst situations in the world uh, the best field to apply this? I worked so hard on myself, I we discussed so much about how the world should look like and what we can do. So, um, the, this question with why I've done, it's, I really don't think a lot <laughs> why. <laughs> I think that this is point in, in the whole line of events. This is action. This is one of moments to, to have space and to, to uh, arrange that people meet together and they, they create some actions. And this is uh, what is my pain point. Because currently I see really a lot of great thoughts, great minds in the world that take very little actions. They have a lot of power, authority power. They have a lot of networks, great networks in the world. A lot of access to great, good, nice money, I would say, because money can be different. But they do, do very little. And, uh, and sometimes this doing very little is not about changing the system because this kind of ambitions I also have and try to do some things so with different nationwide agreements on forests and etc. But about really doing very, very simple things like supporting Sergei schools or finding teachers who could go there and or creating networks or etc. So I was very happy when Lenia uh, asked if we can do in Vilnius because it's city quite close to Belarusia, to, to Russia. And so I thought, yeah, that's great. Let's do. And um, so what I, the, the maybe one thing that I really want to say about Lithuania that uh, it's not my words, but they are words from Pema Chodron. Buddhist monk, uh, I remember her because she gave, she gave me or I read her note about compassion, uh, that compassion is first of all empowerment. And uh, compassion is not meeting the one who is wounded, meets healer, but is the meeting of equals and only the one who can deeply understand and accept your own shadows, so his or her own shadow can really meet pain of the other. So compassion is about really meeting in our shared humanity. And for me, in the moment uh, with the beginning of a war, at the, uh, the first days I really had a lot of anger and I had a lot of adrenaline kind of action to do something. But then during a few days it faded away. I lost my energy and I stopped and I really Go went into silence, I stopped, I, I wanted to do things, but I had nothing, n no energy. And then I found that I have something, I want really to, to create something for, for peace, for future, for some of my childish idealistic dreams, how, what might look like, and, um, and so what gives energy. So I really want that Lithuanians, we, we, we think we do quite many things. We reflect very little. We act, we collect money, we, we go, go, we can do anything, go to fight, uh, collect billions in one week. But we don't talk a lot about how do we feel, how, how does it touch us, how do we feel about future, and uh, without our being so close and also being among many people who tell these stories. And so I truly think that um, uh, it's not about making a new strategy for 2030 or 2050, because this also makes me very sad that we write really great documents, really great documents, but it's, they won't be implemented because we don't know what does it mean to experience many of these things. To, to, to create democracy, you need to experience it in the classroom, at your workplace. And if you experience very different uh, way of doing things, so how we can create it? We just create words, fake the meaning behind. So this is what 
gives me a lot of pain. I see great initiatives, quite unilaterally done, very little space and time for reflection, for, for deep conversations, for creating friends, for having fun, and for also grieving together. And, and I think that we building will come, I don't know what kind of way, maybe not with the schools, <laughs> folk schools, maybe some other way, but I'm sure that it will come because Nordic countries are too close. They breathe in us, we look at them, we want to be also rich and happy and successful. And at the same time, we still remember the past and the past also breathes at us today. So. At this point, I would like to um, engage you guys. And there are two ways um, I'd like to offer you to, to, in, to get involved. First of all, may you have any questions to our guest speakers? Uh, please let me know. Just sh sh raise your hands um, and we would be happy to translate the question in case that, that there is a language issue. But also there is the second line, and you may choose both, or any. Um, there was one quote in this particular book that inspired me a lot. And the, it was the quote by Humboldt, one of the guys on the slide that was jumping here and there, and who said, um, war is one of the best times for Bildung. Uh, because it's the time where our characters are checked and forged. And he didn't encourage to go into wars, but he knew the war. He was from that times. And he actually noticed that there is something special happening in the collective consciousness. Uh, during war, which is connected to Bildung. So what I encourage you to do is, may, may you have any questions, please just go ahead and ask. Otherwise, your stories of how uh, this year, and I, I see mostly Ukrainians here, but there are also Lithuanians whose lives have changed when the war began. So what is your view on the connection between the war and Bildung? Like, was there any impact on your Bildung because of this awful circumstances that we have faced and continuing to face? Can I, can I tell? Yeah. Yes, yeah. You're, you're included. <laughs> you know, in, in, inclusion and diversity is our value, so. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, if you remember, um, Lena showed that uh, this process started in Denmark in very dark times. Uh, when the Denmark uh, lost, lost. lost uh, the war uh, with Germany and uh, Austria, uh, lost 30 persons of territory, uh, the official language uh, German, uh, you can take uh, good quality education only in German or Roman. Uh, so there was, uh, until 1800, the language of governance in Denmark was very often German, or mm -hmm. it was German. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, Danish, you speak with your servant and your dog. Mm -hmm. So German was the language of civilized people. Do you recognize mm -hmm. anything like that from our <laughs> times? But uh, I can to con to continue this line because uh, if you will see the time when this process started in Sweden, uh, you will see that uh, it was the end of the 19th century, especially 1887 uh, was the year when the Riksdag uh, uh, have the uh, solve about uh, financial f uh, for folk high schools. Uh, and this is the time when 25% uh, of the Swedish inhabitants uh, go to Northern America. The country... Immigrated yeah. to, to, to yeah. states. 
and we can continue this line. If you see the time of when this process started in Finland, you will see this is uh, the time of the struggle for their independence. And the uh, highest point of, uh, of, of this uh, uh, movement was in 1914, 1918, during the civil war in Finland. This way it's very interesting connecting how this year uh, connecting with the idea of building, in the special in context of Ukraine. Three years ago, when I spoke with Ukrainian politics and uh, told them about uh, this experience, I see the glass eyes. They don't understand anything about uh, these things. And I thought, what must happen in this country for starting this process? Because I know the history of your country and, and this process. We have this uh, existence uh, problem, and this is a time, existential, sorry, yeah. and this is a time for our Ukrainian building now. But I can uh, say some words about Lithuania, I know too. Yeah. Um, actually, that's a good question to Irena. What is your view? What should happen in Lithuania so that the population would be really keen about um, developing um, the building practices or anything related to it? I try to avoid thinking in the prof prophetic kind of way <laughs> what, what should... Uh, I think... Um, I think uh, there is no need for something more difficult or complicated. <laughs> there is no need because it's enough to really face the reality as it is. And uh, what's, what's really needed, I would say the kind of uh, uh, at least one, one real gathering be between great-minded minds and, and people in power to accept that just competence-based uh, uh, education, that uh, all these curriculum or programs that are univer at universities or at schools, if they don't have uh, the element of uh, who I am, how I relate with others, what challenge just in the world, in my country do I observe, and how we can uh, work together solving them. If, if uh, our all education programs, if we have plenty of them, great, from third age universities to, to private schools, non-state schools, but I think that uh, they are very much yet focus, uh, focused on the, those practical market, uh, I don't know, f market needs or market expectations um, following uh, uh, qualities or education. And if we would really uh, just agree for, for, just agree that it's not enough. Uh, it's not enough, I think things would start because we have enough of resources and I think a knowledge and people who could do this, but this could be in, in some of our priorities for, for financing projects, for, for making some other initiatives that also development, human development uh, within society, not only as, as human resource element, is extremely important in this time. I think, I just think we need time and some courage for this. Uh, I have a, <coughs> a couple of things that I, I want to say. One thing with regards to, to Lithuania, I think the, the war in Ukraine has been a shock to all of us um, and it has raised awareness deep into the West also about um, what actually went on in Russia and what is going on in Russia and I have uh, not paid attention to Russia as much as I should have, but I know that I paid more attention than most people in, in Denmark. And I was kind of aware of this whole Putin youth kind of movement where they have basically trained young people to, you know, a, a totalitarian, authoritarian mindset with uniforms and basically Hitler youth in a 21st century um, 
design, so to speak, ironically with American baseball caps as part of the uniform. But there's something about Western culture, everybody wants part of it, even though they say they want something else. Um, but um, the first time that I realized the, 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 the longing, the urge in Eastern Europe to become part of or to, to relate to Europe and be considered European and not just former Soviet states and Eastern European countries was when we hosted the first uh, European Bildung Day online in 2020 due to COVID. And we hosted a, a, a fireside chat with um, uh, uh, participation, no, actually it was a, a bit later, but that same year uh, a fireside chat online with uh, three speakers, guests from um, uh, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and somebody from the Balkans. And what I realized was that here were particularly uh, the, the person from Belarus uh, and uh, Mikhail Krikunov, who you already mentioned, from uh, Ukraine. They had both studied in Moscow during the Soviet era. And so their whole youth and their career path and their sense of if I want to be, you know, have a career, I have to play by the rules of Moscow. Um, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union and perhaps even a prospect of becoming part of, of the EU, there was this cultural, mental, tectonic shift in attention and identity that moved away from Moscow towards the West and suddenly it was not Russian, but English that would be the sort of lingua franca of, you know, connecting to the world and having a future. Um, and before I came here, I was in Moldova. We actually planned to host the European Bildung Day in Kiev, but decided to come to, um, yeah, here instead. Um, but I was in, in Moldova and I, I sensed the same thing. It was a conference hosted by um, the capital city now and they want it to become more a safe city, inclusive city, green city and they focus would focus on education, infrastructure and different things. And it's, it's just amazing to sense and a lot of uh, Western Europeans and other outside this part of the world are not realizing how big the urge and the drive for becoming part of sounds wrong because this is the free world, but becoming part of the free world uh, and that openness and having those liberties. And I love the fact that you have that uh, liberty and, and the building together there because that is the whole point. Um, and we have lost our language for this or we're not using it in Denmark anymore. And we have become sucked into that vortex of PISA testing in the schools and just educating people for the job market. And we're throwing away all the aesthetic uh, topics in school and we're forgetting about the building thing. Or at least we did for 20 years, now it's coming back. Um, but I would say the, the whole testing regime, all the measurements in school, everything that the PISA test and the OECD has put upon the educational systems, where we had functioning educational systems, it has ruined the educational systems. And so what I sense, even from people from the OECD and, and sort of the PISA testing people, they're beginning slowly to realize that we need something else. There is that other ingredient in good education that is about moral values, uh, liberty, democracy, becoming a, a conscientious citizen, daring to speak up and uh, developing your own, you know, point of views and daring to stand up for them and, you know, speak in a group of people and maybe having the unpopular viewpoint and not just saying what everybody else is saying. And just one more thing with that because yesterday I was also speaking to a group of business leaders online and we talked about building and how that could be used in the corporate business world. And we have a you know, very egalitarian leadership style in the Nordic countries because of this Bildung thing and because of good education. Uh, but we, so in many instances, if you have somebody who's a, a guy on the floor, working class person who knows more about a topic than the leaders, they would speak up and say, you know what, uh, the thing you just suggested, 
is probably not going to work because I know something you don't. Here's, here's a better solution. And to have a culture where you can speak up, literally speak up in that way, allows you to have a different kind of creativity, a different kind of leadership. Um, and one of the things that, um, and, and that comes with building, that comes with building from the, the bottom and building from the top, and the, so you can have a different kind of workplace as well, and it's that extra thing. Thank you. Friends, any questions, thoughts? I have, I have a question. Can I you always have a question. Let's let's see, yeah. let's see. Are you there remember that uh, court? What court did in yes. this school? Inquiry. He used questions here yeah? exactly. and used stories. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, but uh, he also engaged different students, right? Yeah. So let yeah. us engage yeah. another um, uh, participant, and you will be the next. Yeah, so how do we do uh, building in the existing educational system? What are, what are the differences? It's um, asking the kids more about uh, their thoughts. Um, there's, a th there's a question that I got in Moldova, and I get it from uh, people here in Eastern Europe in a way that I've never gotten it in, in Denmark. How, how do we treat... What do we do about kids who don't behave? So we have them in school, they don't behave. I've never gotten that question in Denmark. And when you think about it, maybe it's not the kids who don't behave, maybe we created a system that's not suitable for children and then we ca call it school. So if I were to decide, so all children are born curious. They, they learn to speak and they start asking questions and they can drive you crazy from their two years old. Then they come to school and we take it out of them. It's almost as if we created a system that would kill curiosity. And then when children don't comply with that, we call it misbehavior. So we need to think about what is natural for children when they want to learn. Well, it's to ask questions. How do we make education where children's questions are central. It doesn't have to you know, decide all the education, but it has to be there, and they have to feel that what they're interested in knowing, we're prepared to tell them, or give them the tools so they can explore it and find the answers. So one way of doing it is to have you know, more openness towards what are the kids actually interested in learning, and that will make them feel heard and it will get them the sense of, I matter, my questions matter. If I want to know something, the adults are listening and they're giving me answers or letting me export uh, to myself, for myself. And another thing uh, which I suggest to a Danish school, so it's not like we're perfect and, and know everything, which is storytelling. And we were actually talking about that uh, earlier today. I used to be a, um, a substitute teacher and I had this uh, sense of if I were to read stories to the kids, it was either just to keep them quiet or because they had behaved well. And I think many teachers are, yeah, you can have a story if you behaved well during class. We should turn that around and think, storytelling is the most important thing we can do with the kids in class because it expands their vocabulary, it um, good storytelling is about moral values, and once you have their attention, it was what Cole did, and it still works. Um, you can ask them about who would you have liked to be in that story? Who did you feel was, who, who in this story would you like to have as a friend? Who in this story would you not like to have as a friend? And then you can have a discussion about, now why would you want to have that person as a friend? And why didn't you want the other person as a friend? And this is how you can have this character building, the, the building part, the development of your own moral values and finding out about yourself what you think is important. So you don't uh, teach moral values, 
but you're open for the conversation. And having that conversation, I bet that in any school system, you can do this. Um, and you will then open for a different kind of, of conversation. And if nothing else, I mean, you teach Lithuanian in Lithuanian schools, and you teach Ukrainian in Ukrainian schools, and they're supposed to get to know their cultural heritage anyway. So you can, you can read those stories in, in those, um, uh, during those lessons. So I think that there, there is a lot that can be done within the existing school system. But it's more uh, a shift uh, in the frame of mind than in the curriculum itself. And, uh, and, and we just started this conversation this afternoon. And you can just ask Irena, because she has a program in the making, and, and there we will, uh, everything will be ready in, uh, I don't know, what, a year, six months from now? Uh, there will be testing grounds, and you can participate in the experiment. So uh, if to follow a little bit, you, Alina, sometimes it seems that changing the system, we need some new institutions or some really kind of a hard work to be done, like uh, rules, guidelines, or some, some uh, supervisors and some really uh, the whole machine to, 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 to create in order to make, uh, to bring building to a country. But what Lenia says and said today at school, it's about much more uh, down to earth, behavioral, things and they are the most complicated. Teacher can ask the question the way nobody would like to answer. So so this and and this is the most and this to reach the point where you're really curious and you really want to tell the stories or ask questions, you really need to grow as a person. And this is not an easy growth. It's meeting that maybe your expectations towards yourself as a teacher were false and that you don't have any, any programs to learn that, just to, to, to really to trust and explore. So that's why it's about building. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a question that I very often ask in, in one of my building workshops. Just think for a couple of seconds back to your own time in school. Who was the teacher that you liked the most and that taught you the most and where you felt that you got the most out of the you know, time you spent with them? And what was it that made such a difference and made them a great teacher? Uh, we could go around the room and we can do that afterwards. But the, the answer that I usually get, there are two answers that come up again and again. One is, that person was really enthusiastic about it and they opened my world to something I had never heard about before or I didn't see the full you know, depth of it and suddenly it became interesting. But the other question that, uh, or answer that is really, you know, maybe 80% of the time is, the teacher saw me. I felt understood. They understood me and there was a relationship. And so it doesn't really matter how good they were at teaching. It was that they saw me, I felt seen and understood, and so they cared about me, and so I cared about what they were saying. So it's a completely different dimension than what we talk about when we usually talk about education. Uh, I have a question to Sergei. It will be in Ukrainian, it's easier for me, uh, about uh, school education. Uh, Otto von Bismarck сказав, що війни виграються не скільки на полі бою, скільки біля шкільної дошки. Uh, хотіла б запитати особисто вашу думку, не, оскільки ви сторітелер, uh, і це про майбутнє. Яким ви бачите е, освіту українську у майбутньому, коли Україна е, переможе у цій клятій війні і треба буде відновлювати багато чого з нуля? Е, на мою думку, до цього е, належить і українська освіта, яку треба міняти в корені. Е, яка ваша особиста думка, е, з чого треба буде почати? І що треба запровадити, аби ми виховували е, таких 
розвинених, освічених особистостей, як у країнах, у нордік країнах. Дякую. Я говорю українською, так? Дякую дуже, бо мені так легше. Дивіться, ви підняли настільки важливе питання, що більш важливішого питання насправді нема, бо освіта і формальна, і неформальна – це є єдиний соціальний механізм, який призводить до необхідних трансформацій. Більше того, відтовхуючись від Лоренса Харрісона, за ним там Фукуяма, багато кого стоїть, то зрозуміло, що ніякі інституційні зміни не будуть успішними, якщо це не буде підкріплено змінами в суспільстві і в культурі. А це можливо тільки через освіту, іншого засобу нема. Тому що б ми не робили, як би ми не говорили, що б ми там собі не придумали. План Маннергі, я не розумію, як це план, після Сетин Фолл Тро для Германії, план Маршала, що б ми там не придумали. Якщо першим кроком не буде змінена система освіти, або прийняті якісь рухи для цього, нічого не відбудеться. Тепер питання як? І отут я вже буду відповідати беземоційно, бо для себе я це багато разів відрефлексував. Я дійсно помилився з презентацією, я вибачаюсь за це, бо якщо б була інша, був би шанс показати взаємозв'язок. Я подивився повністю картину про те, що Катерина говорила, що топ-10 – світових країн, які знаходяться в соціоорієнтованих дослідженнях, це скандинавські країни очолюють ці, нордичні країни очолюють цей список. І далі я подивився, в яких країнах представлена концепція більдунгу або фольтбільдунгу, якщо казати про скандинавський варіант. Так от прямий зв'язок, розумієте? Тобто успіх є там, де є інфраструктура фольтбільдунгу там, де є історія фольбільного. І це говорить про те, що що ми не робили, якщо ми цього кроку не зробимо, ну, нічого не відбудеться. І це для мене говорить про те, що ну, як, видумують паровоз, да, то є, він вже є. Бо я багато, ну, часто чую від колег в Україні, що ти там, ну, що ти норвічні, у нас своє, панове, Результат свого – те, що ми зараз маємо. От все, крапка. Тобто на цьому можна зупинитись. Сухамлінський, Ушинський – це виключення із правил. Виключення, розумієте? І при цьому всьому ми маємо єдиний досвід трансформації суттєвої національної культури – це галицька просвіта яка, до речі, стартувала на рік пізніше від Швеції, в Швеції формально 1867 рік, Галицька просвіта стартувала в 1886 році. І коли ми попросили інститут львівський імені Івана Франка дослідити філософські коріння, форми реалізації просвіти і дидактику, яку вони використали, виявили, що вони базуються на німецькій філософії Більдунгу, а використовували всі форми, які використовували скандинавські країни. На цього руху на 38-й рік 300 тисяч офіційних членів просвіти. Рік свої існування відмови державних дотацій. І те, що в величині відбулося, це результат цього руху. Тому я впевнений, що не треба видумувати нічого, треба досліджувати і робити. Тепер наступне питання. Як? Будь-яка спроба 
вбудувати якісь фрагментарні рішення скандинавської освіти в українську систему освіт, якийсь це нова українська школа. Вони не дають результатів. Чому? Тому що вся система формальної і неформальної освіти обслуговує домінуючу ідею в суспільстві. Домінуюча ідея скандинавського суспільства – це Nordic Model of Well-Being State. Все, крапка, розумієте? Тобто, якщо це базується на цінностях рівності, справедливості, то ви заходите в данську школу і бачите цю рівність і справедливість в реалізації. Відсутність оцінок до 8 класу, відсутність превелігірованих шкіл, Приватні школи є, але всі фінансуються із державного бюджету. Заборона на фінансування будь-яких інших джерел. Тобто дитина з такого віку знає, що от цей кронпринц ходить такого ж віку, і він ходить в цю школу. А якщо якомусь бізнесмену хочеться елітно освіти, то він вимушений відправляти в Британію цю дитину. В Скандинавії всі будуть ходити. І навіть по медичній системі, як інституційно реалізується ця штука, да просто реалізується. Крон прицеса Швеції ходить в одну поліклініку з нашою колегою Анастасією Некрасовою. Все, зі своїми дітьми. Дуже просто. Як в порівнянні, я говорю про американську систему неформальної освіти і скандинавську систему. Як для американської системи, це дуже багато людей, які можуть дозволити участь в цих кінцях приватних університетів, приватних школ і інші кінцях адультів. In Sweden, from 50, all kinds of adult education is free. Or you can take the credit with a zero percent of, uh, uh, how it's in English, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, you understand, yeah? And, uh, Sweden, uh, from 1950 till 1960 has explosions of uh, people who took part in education system. Ну, от і все. Тобто все це є. Треба брати і переносити. І останнє. В мережі українських державних педагогічних університетів. Тобто ключ Ключова точка змін – це створення Скандинавського університету з скандинавськими викладачами, які готують першу плеяду українських вчителів в своїй культурі, в своїй парадигмі. Після цього можна говорити вже про все інше. Іншого виходу нема. Ну, з моєї точки зору. Я хочу дякувати shortly add, I will do it in Ukrainian. Відповідь на це питання також міститься в п'ятій главі цієї книги. Ілєна каже про те, що ключ до радикальних змін в освіті полягає в зрілості вчителів, які йдуть до дітей. І, власне, в цій книзі представлена одна з моделей, валідованих научних моделей, як можна працювати виміряти, побачити, як люди відрізняються з точки зору їхньої психологічної зрілості. Одна з цих моделей називається модель Роберта Кігана, про неї можна прочитати в відкритому доступі, і він говорить про п'ять стадій. Так от Лене пише про те, що для того, щоб система запрацювала, нам потрібні люди в класах, які перебувають принаймні щонайменше, на стадії самоавторства. Вона так називається. Self-authoring англійською мовою. Це означає, що людина вже сама має свій власний внутрішній компас. Інтелектуальний, емоційний, моральний, духовний. Це людина, яка є ентузіастом, яка щиро любить дітей, і при цьому вона постійно розвивається і росте сама. Тобто вона займається власним більдунгом. В якості асистентів, пише Лєне, 
можна відправляти до вчителів 20-22-річних молодих людей, які перебувають на попередніх стадіях розвитку, які одночасно навчаються у цієї людини, яка виступає в якості ментором, і водночас є рольовими моделями для тих дітей, які є ще на попередніх стадіях розвитку. Відповідно, те, про що сказав щойно Сергій, нам потрібно відправляти українських вчителів в іншу систему, соціальну, інфраструктурну, економічну, для того, щоб вони побули, визріли разом з менторами з іншої культури, яка є більш зрілою, те, з чого починала Лене, cultural maturity, культурна зрілість. Очевидно, що нордичні країни мають цю найбільш зрілу культуру, ніж наша. І там, перезапилюючись, навчаючись, можна інтегрувати через власний більдунг такі практики, з якими можна прийти до українських дітей і бути тими рольовими моделями, через які вони можуть відкалібруватися і таким чином зрощувати наше суспільство, робити його більш зрілим. Дякую. So, yes, I understood every word of this. So, I do not understand uh, Ukrainian, but I did pick up a few things. Uh, education in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Finland is free uh, primary uh, education, secondary education, tertiary education. In Sweden, uh, you can get student loans without interest. I think that is correct. In Denmark, you get a monthly grant. We're, bas we're paying young people to study. So I think that you get maybe 800 euros uh, per month as a, as a university student if, or high school student if you're older than 18 years. Um, because we want people we, we want people to study and we want, so we invest in people. The, that's the formal education. Informal education, which would be um, lifelong learning. Um, actually, formal education uh, subsidized by the unions. If it's work-related, you can get that for free, and the government will also pay for it. If it's evening classes or folk high schools or any other informal education that you choose because you you know, you're curious, you want it. So it can be uh, French for beginners, it can be uh, French uh, level two, it can be wine tasting, how to navigate your boat, all that sort of informal education. If you want to go to a folk high school, um, it is subsidized by the government, but is not fully financed by the government. And I think it's usually around one third uh, that is covered by government subsidies. And I think it's the same in Sweden. I'm on the board of the uh, Nordic Folk High School in Gothenburg. I know the budget, it's not covered by the government, but we do get subsidies. Um, so um, I think that was it. So there are certain incentives. Люди мотивовані, тому що вони, їм створені максимальні е, умови для того, щоб вони продовжували навчатися і розвиватися протягом всього життя. Тобто це ну, на рівні ідеології, філософії держави інвестувати в людей як найкращий капітал і найкращий е, як базврат та, по повернення цих інвестицій. Е, останні ми, на жаль, маємо дуже скоро завершити. І ваш коментар – you're welcome. Так. Uh, here is my floor. Uh, wait, please. Uh, nearly two hours. We will continue our conversation. Uh, especially for Lithuanian peoples. Uh, dear, the first folk university was, convers uh, conversated, uh, was uh, created in Lithuania in 1915. Uh, from 1915 to 1926, uh, Lithuania had 50 six folk universities. In 1928, uh, there were 160,000 uh, participants in uh, these 56 uh, folk universities. Lithuania had 
very deep and very interesting history of folk being and folk high school in your country. It's uh, more than 10 persons of adult, uh, uh, adult people in Lithuania studied in folk universities. This is Lithuania. Uh, and I also would like to, to, to remind the folk Lithuanians there was this Tautinės um, Mokykos Concepcija, or the conception of uh, no, national school, or how to translate. And this conception was also together done with Latvia and Estonia at the very beginning of the uh, independence revolution in the 90s, in the early 90s. And so if to look at this conception, to even to look at the, the core scheme, we see that this is exactly about building because it's about moral values. It's about the, the your national identity in the global world. It's about relationship with industry, with everything. So, uh, yes, it's. I think this is the main shift that happened. Uh, we kind of lost uh, it or put into some some. Uh, somewhere uh, 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 yeah, in the shadow because of a very natural uh, stage of development in our country with the free market economy, with the focus to really offer competence uh, that is uh, accepted by, by the corporations. And this is nothing wrong. It's just not enough today. <laughs> Thank you, friends. Uh, on the last note, uh, I know there are many educators here, um, especially coming from Ukraine. And um, I'd, like, I'd like to share my, my personal inspiration. I think when, when the war uh, began and we went through the experiences that we went through, I had in mind this idea that in education will change because now we know what is really important. Only when you're facing the existential threat, you start to really look into what is truly important. But then it, di it didn't seem so. <laughs> then the competence-based approach, it's still obviously, it's winning. And I just want to, to share with you my inquiry and um, uh, wish to look at it at a systemic level. As parents and as educators, as whatever contributors to whatever de domain you're working in. Like, what is the role of Bildung in our life? And what this war experience and this existential threat may bring as a gift in terms of rethinking Ukraine, rethinking uh, our education, and rethinking our contribution. I'd like to thank Karolina, who was uh, the main like organizer and who um, was taking care of all the small details in order to make this meeting happen. The project that we are now implementing is actually called Rethinking Ukraine. And my fellow colleagues, Viktoras Bakhmetievas and Sandra, whom you met in the beginning, are working hard in order to help us Ukrainians get support, inspiration and resources that are needed in order to reconsider, to re rethink and come back to Ukraine, or even being here, um, nourish Ukraine with new ideas and new visions that can uh, help us rebuild the country and uh, live in a peaceful and meaningful world. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to, to see you again.